Having explored cone sham theory within the context of the local spin density approximation, I'd like to go beyond to the next step and talk about the generalized gradient approximation. So in the local spin density approximation, we have some functional of the density. And in a gradient expansion, the approach that's taken is to say, well, what makes a molecule different than the uniform electron gas? What makes it different is that the density is changing as one moves through space. And so a reasonable thing to expect would be that putting in some sort of dependence on that change in density, which is to say perhaps depending on the gradient of the density or the curvature of the density. In a sense, it's a bit like a Taylor expansion in the density. So the first uh, order term, of course, then would be the gradient. And so here is a, the gradient of the density normalized. So having this row to the four thirds in here gives you a slope that is, uh, is normalized by the absolute magnitude of the density. So uh, that's, again, just a normalization factor. And so you can actually show from exact theory, and Antonovich and Kleinman did this in 1985, that a way to write this would be uh, 1 plus mu times s squared, where s is this gradient term, plus higher order terms, and in a subsequent slide, I'm going to show you uh, uh, results for a functional, this is second order generalized gradient approximation, that actually uses the sort of theoretically correct mu while ignoring these higher terms. But in fact, many of the uh, functionals we'll look at are, are not necessarily based on this explicit derivation, but rather will include the, the spirit of the derivation with some empirical constants. <coughs> So let's, let's look at these uh, corrections in a little bit of bullet detail here. So as I've noted, the electron density is not spatially uniform. We know that LDA has serious limitations for energies, although the geometries are all right. And so we'll try to improve our functionals by making them depend on the degree to which the density is locally changing, which is the gradient. So if I have dependence on both the density and the gradient of the density, I call that a gradient corrected or a generalized gradient approximation, GGA functional. And most, not all, but most GGA functionals are constructed where the correction is a term that's added to the LDA functional. So the GGA exchange or correlation energy density is equal to the LSDA piece plus an additional piece associated with the gradient. And you should verify for yourself, by the way, that this term is dimensionless. There's one of those funny four-thirds power things again, and it looks very intimidating, but it's a, it's a pretty straightforward matter to show that the, uh, the way this is written gives you a dimensionless value. So uh, X or C, that just is indicating whether it's exchange or correlation, and uh, the dependence is on this dimensionless reduced gradient. So the most popular GGA exchange functional that has appeared to date was developed by Axel Becke, who is a researcher in Canada, in 1988. And that paper, that 1988 paper, I just checked it before uh, putting this lecture together in 2013, had 23,000 plus citations. So that gives you some feeling for the impact uh, that Becky Exchange has had on chemistry in general. And uh, Becky developed it so that it would have correct asymptotic behavior at long range for the energy density. There is a single empirical parameter in it, and he uh, optimized that parameter by fitting to the exactly known exchange energies of six noble gas atoms from helium to radon. And so uh, these noble gases had had their energy solved by other means. And uh, using those data, Becky fit a particular parameter and came up with B. Uh, and so B stands for Becky. And in uh, functionals, you'll see B perhaps as the leading letter to imply that that's where the GGA exchange is coming from. There certainly are other exchange functionals out there. There's something called CAMB. So that CAM is Cam Cambridge. It was invented there by Nick Handy's group. Uh, PW is Purdue Wong, FT is Philatoff and Teal in 1998, MPW is a modified Purdue Wong. Uh, there are other kinds of GGA exchange functionals that followed a different approach from Becky, 
In particular, they use a rational function expansion of the reduced gradient. Uh, they don't necessarily contain empirically optimized parameters. Uh, there's one by Becky himself in 1986, prior to this 1988 one, uh, one by Purdue, one by Purdue, Burke, and Ernserhoff. There are correlation functionals, so a Purdue in 86, a Purdue Wong, it's always labeled 91, but actually the, the publication appeared in 92. Uh, LYP correlation, so that's Lee, Yang, and Parr, uh, and it does not add something to the LDA expression. Instead, it's actually the full correlation energy, and it's really based on the helium atom, so a correlation functional that has exact cancellation of self-interaction error. In any case, all of these different functionals are developed, you know, from different viewpoints with an idea towards satisfying perhaps different constraints, and it is a bit of an alphabet soup. Uh, to some extent, it's through benchmarking calculations that people decide uh, which ones are most effective in practice. So in terms of the GGAs, uh, here is this correct I mentioned from uh, this exact expression value of mu that multiplies this gradient term in gradient expansion. Uh, and then in normal GGAs, we in fact just use s, not s squared, and we just pick values of mu that work. So for uh, b and blyp, it's 0 0.2743. In the PBE functional, it's 0 0.2195, and uh, these are either derived from some sort of analysis or optimized empirically. Well, okay, so let's actually look at some of these benchmarking data. So these numbers I showed in the last, uh, last presentation, the Hartree-Fock error on bond energies and barrier heights, the mean unsigned errors, 31 and 9 kcals per mole, respectively. Some improvement in the bond energies, but actually uh, some failure in the barrier heights with LSDA. And now if we look at this formally correct through second order approach, the second order generalized gradient approximation, we again get another factor of two or so over LSDA and bond energies, and we do a little bit better in barrier heights. But finally, let's go to BLYP. So this combines Becke exchange with Li Yang par correlation. Uh, in 1988, these uh, two functional choices were put together and explored. And notice that the error in bond energies now drops substantially, so we get an order of magnitude improvement compared to LSDA. And finally, we've got the barrier heights down in a range that at least is no worse than Hartree-Fock theory. Certainly room for improvement, but it was at this stage, really, in the sort of mid to late 80s, that this kind of performance with a speed that was uh, rivaled Hartree-Fock and improves on Hartree-Fock as molecules get bigger, really aroused the attention of many quantum chemists, and suddenly an enormous amount of energy was placed into, uh, into further development of density functional theory. So what comes next? Well, we're going to look at a few things that come next, but let's just think about kind of a logical next step. If you see improvement when you go from just the density to the density plus the gradient of the density, Sort of the obvious next step is to include the second derivative of the density. That would be the Laplacian of the density. And so Becky and Roussel actually proposed such an exchange functional early on. They called it BR. And Proinoff, Salahub, and co-workers uh, did something similar with correlation. And they called that LAP for Laplacian. A more general name at this stage is a meta-GGA. Meta because it goes beyond the original generalized gradient approximation. And actually, what most people talk about now is not the Laplacian or the second derivative, but instead the kinetic energy density, tau. And so it still has second derivative character, but it's based on the orbitals as opposed to the density itself. And it proves to be a bit numerically more stable to actually introduce the, the second derivative dependence that way. Uh, examples of meta-GGA functionals for exchange or correlation or both, that includes a Becky 95 functional, a Becky 98 functional, ISM, uh, tau HCTH, so that's Hamprecht, Cohen, Tozer, and Handy, and the uh, Minnesota local functionals, M06, so M for Minnesota, developed in 2006, L for local, and we'll say more in the next uh, series of lectures about the distinction between local and non-local. But uh, everything we've talked about till now has been local, and 
these two functionals from Don Trular's group at Minnesota are enjoying uh, considerable success in literature right now. So the cost of the meta-GGA functionals is comparable to that for the GGA, and in general they are more accurate than GGA, and so most modern calculations are employing meta-GGA functionals. Uh, what we will see in the next series of lectures is how to uh, how to capture still greater improvement in accuracy by sacrificing a bit of the speed and incorporating a bit of exact Hartree-Fock exchange energy. So we'll have to pay the cost of computing Hartree-Fock exchange integrals, but we'll see why it might be worth it to do that.